Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. You're on Outsiders with Rowan Dean, Ross Cameron, and we are absolutely delighted, honoured to be joined by Robert Toombs, Professor of European History at Cambridge University. His life's work has been really, uh, he's a frank Ophile, uh, but Franco-British uh, relations. He is a student and voice of the Enlightenment, and I, I have just attended a sold-out lecture that uh, Professor Toombs gave in Melbourne as the guest of the Institute for Public Affairs. He's just reprised that performance with a sold-out lecture tonight. He's just stepped out of the cab from the State Library. Uh, Robert Toombs, welcome to Outsiders. Well, thanks welcome for having me on. Thank you. Now, we particularly um, honour you because we, you became conspicuous during the Brexit debate when, in our judgement, virtually the entire phalanx of tertiary academics were singing the European song, <laughs> more bureaucracy, more enslavement to Brussels and The Hague, more regulation, but there was this one sort of lone voice in <laughs> Cambridge. Tell us what happened. Well, I think the question is the other way around. You know, I, what, what I am, am is one with the majority of the country. I, I think exactly. the way most people think, which is, seems to me, the sensible and normal way to think. The question is why do all my colleagues not think the same way? And that's, uh, that's a bit of a problem, because I don't altogether understand their mindset. Mm. But I think it's partly lack of confidence in, in the country. They don't really identify, I think, with themselves as part of a national community, or not very strongly. They're, they're scared of the, of the outcome, economically. Many of them feel that their careers depend on close relations with the EU. You know, grants come from the EU, students and colleagues come from the EU. And I, so I think it was a very much a, corporate, a sort of corporate reaction on one hand, combined with a kind of lack of any sense of confidence in the country's ability to govern itself or to have a future as an independent, self-governing nation. Mm. That's now, a bit sad. You, you wrote in, in The Spectator that uh, never in modern times has there been such an overt and even contemptuous attempt to deny the legitimacy of a popular yeah. vote. Talk us through that. Um, when I said not for, I mean, in the 19th century, the middle of the 19th century, you had people saying, you know, ordinary people are too stupid to vote, democracy is a disaster, we should m make sure that only people with money or with education should be able to vote and the others should follow the lead that they're given by their betters. We haven't heard that since, I would say, the 1850s, <laughs> and now all of a sudden we're hearing it again. It's you back. Know, people <laughs> can't understand the issues. They're not educated enough, it's too complicated for them. Leave it to us, because we're, we're clever. And this is this whole demonising of the word populist, isn't it? Yeah. Because populist surely just means democratic, but they don't view it yeah, that way. Yeah, it means democratic when you don't agree with it. <laughs> mm. That's right. It's almost that, that, that we did get this view, this post-Brexit Brexit analysis, which was based on the idea that the people who voted uh, to get out were uneducated, uh, working class, uh, racist, xenophobes. What we would call bogans here. Uh, but <laughs> you, as a uh, professor of history, took a different view. Uh, what was the basis on which you voted uh, for Britain to get out of European Union? Yeah. Well, it was, it was essentially a political... For me, it was political. I thought... And I think also a Europe... I think I took a European perspective on this. Uh, I thought the EU was damaging European democracies. In all parts of Europe, the, the loss of power to the nation states and hence to democratically elected governments, the, the, you know, the draining away of power into a kind of black hole in Brussels where they couldn't exercise it. You know, they can't solve the problems of the Eurozone. They can't solve the problems of immigration. And more and more people in Europe are turning away from mainstream politics into extreme politics because they feel that's the only way of having their voices heard. And it seemed to me, you know, this is, this is bad for Europe. Now, you know, you could say, well, Britain should have stayed in the EU and helped to reform it. But I just think that the EU as it now is constituted is not reformable. And in that case, it just seemed sensible for me, to me that we should, 
we should leave. If we can't change it we, and we don't agree with it, we should leave it. Well, this, of course, is Karl Popper's thesis about real science, uh, is that when the, uh, when the thesis fails, you must oh. abandon it. Yes. You don't simply cling to it like a child with a rattle. You know, no matter what the consequences, we must stick to our ideology. Yep. Yep. If it fails, you dump it. <laughs> There's another thing too, if I may say, because I think the issue as it was in 2016 is no longer the issue as it is in 2018. You, know, you, you could decide in 2016 it was better on balance for us to stay in the EU. But now the question is who actually has the right to decide and what would the consequences be of trying to overturn a popular vote? Mm. And I think even if you'd voted to remain in 2016, you should really be saying now the decision is made. And I think this is what many people are saying. The decision's been made quite properly. And to try to go back on that would risk a huge political and constitutional crisis. Tell us about when Theresa May's citizens of nowhere comment and what that all led to. Well, um, it led to a huge amount of criticism, though it seemed to me a fairly anodyne remark. And know. what was she referring to? Well, I think she was, refer she was, she, she was referring in part to um, international corporations which don't pay taxes. Right. You know, you have, if you're a citizen, you have obligations, and that includes participating in political life and paying, and paying your way. And she was just saying that, you know, there are, there are people and there are corporations who regard themselves as not belonging to any country. But I think, you know, it, she may have got the idea from a book by David Goodhart, which has talked about how society is divided into a majority who feel themselves attached to a particular yes. place and a minority of whom people like us are, are usually part who regard themselves as belonging to no particular place and to living in a, a sort of global village. And so, to some extent, that's what the divide's been about. Well, now, just talking about the practical politics, um, it seems to me uh, that the uh, Conservative, allegedly, the Tory uh, government, uh, has generally fallen into a bit of a bog, yeah. uh, but nowhere more conspicuously than on Brexit. Yes. Um, give us the update. You do publish a blog, which is called... Briefings for Brexit. Briefings for Brexit, <laughs> which we encourage our, uh, our viewers to log on to. Give us the current briefing for Brexit. Oh, well, we've got a big new article by a, um, a professor of international relations called Gwythian Prince, who is um, predicting the fairly speedy demise of the EU. It's become too complex. It's failing to deliver to its peoples. And we can see how more and more legitimacy and, and popular support is breaking down. You, know, you can see it in Italy most recently. It's clearly the case in, in Greece. To some extent in Spain, you know, Spain's divided. Germany, inability to form a government until now. You know, everywhere the EU is, has, is proving to be a cause of problems and not a cause of solutions. Do you foresee these European states following Britain's example? And also, how, when are Britain going to get out? What is, what is going well, on? What's this endless toing and froing? Well, you know, the, the, most of the political class, and that includes a lot of the government, have, haven't really convinced themselves that this was a, a good decision. And, and it seems that they're regarding this as a damage limitation exercise. Whereas I think there's, there's no evidence that this decision is or will be damaging for us. It should be an opportunity. But, you know, you've got to carry it out now anyway. And by your argument, the, how, how would the citizens revolt if it doesn't get carried out? Well, I don't think we can predict that. I mean, an, an, obvious, an obvious possibility would be a, uh, a return to, um, to, to the, the, um, the growth of, or the rebirth of UKIP, the United yes. Kingdom Independence Party, you know, a sort of populist party outside the mainstream of politics, which would be attracting votes from both the Conservative and the Labour parties. Um, well, my, my experience recently in, in London was that everyone in London yeah. was, was, uh, hated the idea of Brexit and wanted to remain. Yeah. Everyone outside of London <laughs> was desperate to... Ex well, have it's, you got two, it's very funny. two lands there? Have you got two completely different... To some you referred to the globalists. We call yeah. them the insiders and the outsiders. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to what degree is that kind of elitist... You've written about the revulsion against history, about their own history. How much of the elites, we certainly find it here in Australia, hate our own history, hate Australian history. Is that the experience in Britain? Well, 
Yeah, for, I mean, for quite a long time, we've, we've been convincing ourselves that our history is, is terrible. Well, some people have. Yes. I mean, I don't think it's true. As, as in Australia, most people don't feel this. But some people feel that it's a history of exploitation, racism, imperial conquest. Here we so. call them the ABC, the Guardian, and a couple of other names. <laughs> Sydney Morning Herald. And, yeah, and okay. the entire government, both Liberal and Labour. Yeah. Yes. I mean, our history is not like that. It's certainly not all like that. But, um, you know, there are people who seem to get a kind of kick or a sense of moral superiority by detaching themselves from what they see as the, well, okay, you know, the intellectually inferior to themselves. Mm. It's a kind of... Um, elitism. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, it's a kind of elitism. Well, look, we're going to throw up the cover of your uh, recent uh, opus, uh, mm -hmm. a, a thousand-page <laughs> achievement. <laughs> Very uh, short, really. The English and the History... Uh, we, are, we believe that we love history more on this show uh, than anyone else. Um, tell us uh, what is the thesis of that great work. Oh, well, thank you. For, it's, it's, not a, it's not a book with a thesis. It's a, it's a story. Mm. I mean, I wanted to tell the story for people who didn't know it. And we, in, in Britain, as I think in Australia find that history is not a subject that is taught much in schools, or not very well. Hardly at all and in Australia. And I th it seemed to me there was an appetite, and it seems that there was, for um, a book that would tell people, give them a straight story and explain to them what's happened in the past and how we've, how we've thought about it. Mm. That's what the book tries to do. If, it's, if it has a thesis, it's to say that, you know, things, have, things are not as dark as you've often been told. <laughs> but our, our history is actually fairly, it's pretty successful. We've been lucky. Mm. But um, you, do, you do say, uh, well, one of your theses is that uh, the, health of, the health of our institutions, it's similar here, uh, you know, the great institutions that made yeah. Britain great, they're under assault from the left, I would argue, neo-Marxism and so on, but Islam even. What are your thoughts? How, it's, flesh that out for us. Um, I think that uh, most I, well, actually, I think the Brexit vote, to get back to that, was a, was a vote of confidence in our institutions. Self-governing, yep. parliamentary democracy and so on. Um, I, don't think our, I don't think we're... Um, I mean, it's, it's fashionable, as you say on the left, to say we're in a political crisis, nothing works. Well, most people don't seem to feel that. People vote. People vote for their, the two main parties. They vote for national self-determination. That seems to me a vote of confidence. But nevertheless, there is, a, I think, a minority who like to feel that everything is bad and getting worse and that you know, everything's always been bad and it's even worse now. <laughs> I want to put a... Um, speaking of the, of the uh, British and the... Or the English and the history? Or the yeah, British? well, I, uh, to be honest, I didn't, I didn't think I had the energy to do <laughs> the Scotland, whole. Ireland yes. and Wales as well. <laughs> yes. Scotland's irrelevant. Um, <laughs> Cut it off at Scotland's the Hadrian's right. Wall. You know. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, look, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to sort of take you uh, a bit yeah. off okay. piece here and, and say that you mentioned in your uh, beautiful lecture um, as part of the IPA's Western Civilisation Programme, uh, you made reference to the great uh, Scottish Enlightenment uh, philosopher and historian David Hume. Yes. Um, now, as I understand it, uh, Edward Gibbon, who was, uh, he said that his most prized review came from David Hume, and that when David <laughs> Hume said of Edward Gibbon's rise and uh, yeah. fall of the Roman Empire that that was the thing that he most loved, and then we have in Winston Churchill, uh, who also won a Nobel Prize mm. for Literature, not least because of his history of the English-speaking people, uh, he referred to Gibbon as a rollicking reed, in which <laughs> he loved uh, every, every page. Who, uh, besides Robert Toons, is your favourite English <laughs> historian? I'm not my own favourite English historian. <laughs> um, wow, that's good. you should have given me notice of that question. Um, I, are we talking about classic works of history, not modern ones? Well, look, I'm open-minded. I mean, Basically, somebody just like... Just say Marcus Aurelius. Somebody like Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius. That's the only book he's read. All right. Paul, then you'll be I have to then say the venerable, the venerable Bede. 
<laughs> Venerable B, yes. yes. Excellent. And he was really, we would say, wouldn't we, one of the... I mean, Julius Caesar was himself a great historian. Mm. Of the, He was the historian of the Gallic Wars. Mm. Um, we... Uh, Bede yeah. gave us... He was a, a patriarch, really, of the, of the English church, would we yeah. say? Well, and, he invents the idea that there is an English mm. people. Mm. You know, he writes a book called the ecclesiastical history of the English people. Well, there wasn't an English people. There were Northumbrian people and there were Kentish people and there was, you know, Mercians and so on. And Bede kind of invents the idea that we were a nation. Mm. So you have to say that that's the greatest historical... He has the greatest influence of any historian because he creates the idea of the thing that he's writing about. Yes. What, what's uh, England's future? Well, I hope as, an, well, England's future as part of the United Kingdom yes. uh, will be as an independent um, and, I, th I hope, brave and well-governed player of, in, of interna in international politics and the international economy. I mean, a lot of people say the Brexit vote is an inward-looking vote. I don't think there's any evidence of that. People, what people want is, to be, is not to be shut into a, a European Union, they want to be able to play a part in the world, including with our, with our friends in, in, in Australia. And I've been amazed at how much support for Brexit there is in Australia among people I've met. In fact, I actually got applauded tonight <laughs> when I mentioned Brexit. If I'd gone to any similar uh, um, assembly in Britain, I'd have been booed. I mean, the, the middle classes in Britain and the middle classes in Australia take an entirely different view of this. And it's rather encouraging to think that we're not going to be ostracised and treated as outcasts. Mm. Well, there's still the whole uh, Australian an angst over that queue at Heathrow, which every Australian sits there going... Oh, yeah, oh. well, that's one of the things we have to change. <laughs> well, look, I'm going to take uh, the opportunity of your presence to give just a flagrant plug that if you're asking yourself the question, how do we push back? How do we arm ourselves with the facts and with reason? How do we associate with others who wish to push back? You've got a, if you've got a lazy $99, can I suggest there's few better things you could do with it than join the Institute mm. for Public Affairs, who invited Professor Toombs to Australia. Uh, Bella Debrera, one of the outsiders on this sh show previously, leads the program for Western Civilisation at the IPA. Uh, Janet Albrechtson uh, gave an absolutely stirring address last night calling on mums and dads to teach their children Western history and Western values. So uh, if you want to give a gift to someone you love and you've got 100 bucks, if you're under 25, you can join for $22. So thanks so much to John Roscombe, the fearless leader of the IPA, and Bella Debrera for bringing uh, Professor Robert Toombs to Australia and tonight to Outsiders. It's been and a don't... real tonic. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget to buy your Robert's book. <laughs>